Welcome back to Better Than a Pill. Today, I am so excited to have Jennifer Moore here as a guest. And Jennifer is an author, an empathic mentor, and master trainer for EFT International. And today, she's going to help us understand exactly what an empath is, as well as explain more about a method called EFT, what it is and how it can be used for self-care, healing, physical pain, and also emotional regulation. So welcome, Jennifer. It's so good to have you here today. Thank you so much, Carrie. It's so, so good to be here. You know, you have been doing your work for quite some time and you are a bit of an expert at this point, right? Yeah, I guess you could say I'm a bit of an expert at this point. I can definitely say I've been doing it for a while. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So, so tell me, so what is the difference between empathy and being an empath and, and how does that relate to women over 40? How does it relate to women over 40? So let's start with the first question, which is what's the difference between empathy and being an empath? So sometimes it's actually, ironically, it can almost be the exact opposite because to have empathy means the ability to imagine what another human being is going through and to put ourselves in their shoes and to feel what they're experiencing. But very much aware that we are feeling what somebody else is experiencing and imagining that that, you know, that that's what they're going through. So there's an understanding of that separation. An empath, which is a science fiction term, which started back in the 1950s from a a short uh, sort of a novella um, story called The Empath, and then sort of started to get mainstream popularity through actually both the original Star Trek and then the next generation is a term for a being who has extrasensory perception that allows them to, or sometimes it's not allows them to, but causes them to pick up the thoughts, the feelings, the energy, and the sensations from the world around them. But the difference between somebody who is very intuitive or very psychic Um, or even somebody who has empathy, is that the empath processes all of that information as if it's their own. And so what makes it challenging to be an empath is that often the empath will be sensing distress, but instead of being like, oh my goodness, I sense that there's a lot of distress here. It seems like that like somebody must be really upset about something, the empath walks into a space and is like, why do I feel so upset? Why do I feel so sad? So like, for example, if they went to a place where maybe there had been a sickness and a death and a lot of grief, the psych- a psychic would have walked in there and go, wow, I sense there's a lot of grief in here. It seems like somebody must have recently died. The empath goes in and is just like, oh my God, I feel so sad. I feel so much grief right now. And so the thing about this is that ironically, when somebody is wired in this way to be picking up the thoughts, feelings, energy, and sensations coming from the world around them, sometimes it can be so overwhelming to be processing all of this extra stuff that it's actually really hard to have empathy for other people because we're so, we're drowning in the emotional soup. And, and also not necessarily able to recognize what's ours and what's not ours. So to answer the next question, which is what does this have to do with women over 40? What I have found to be true for so many women over 40 is that this whole, you know, all of the sort of more woo concepts that younger people like millennials and um, Gen Zs and all of these people are sort of like, they take it for granted. They, they just sort of like, are like, yeah, this is just how it is. For many of us who are 40 and over, we grew up in an environment where this stuff did not exist except on Star Trek. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody was acknowledging it. And those of us who were highly sensitive 
and you know, and and who identify or who didn't even know the term empath, but were experiencing what it's like to be an empath, were often being told you're being too sensitive, you're overreacting, you're taking it too personally, you're making too big a deal out of it. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. There's nothing going on here. And so I think that for many women, especially women 40 and over, there is a way in which there was so much denial and igno- and and ignoring of our of this sensitivity that a lot of times what that did was caused us to doubt our truth and doubt ourselves and doubt our reality because we would be like we'd pick something up and instead of our mother or father or friend being like oh my god you're so right i'm really feeling this thing Often because we lived in a time where everybody was kind of like, you know, going along to get along and again, sort of like keeping up with the Joneses and everything was all about appearances and looking good, as well as just kind of like suppressing emotion. There was very often a lot of invalidation and denial that went on. And so I think we have an entire generation of women who've been kind of struggling with this, like, why am I feeling this way? There is nothing wrong in my life. There's nothing like, it doesn't make sense that I feel so weird. I must be broken. There must be something wrong with me because I'm feeling this and that doesn't make any sense at all. And because of that, I think that for women, especially over 40, there is a lot of, it's really important to be able to be like, oh, this is what I am. This is why I've been experiencing this. And instead of sort of drinking the Kool-Aid and going along with the people who are like, there's nothing wrong here. Pay no attention. Like, yeah, you know, just stop worrying about it. Move along, folks. Nothing to see here. That instead of complying with that, there's such incredible power in saying, no, I know what is going on. I know this to be true. You may not want to acknowledge it. You may not want to validate that this is happening, but I'm exper- I'm sensing something and it's not coming from in here. You know, like the call is not coming from inside the house. Yeah, no, that's uh, definitely new information for me. And I'm sure for a lot of our listeners here today, because I didn't know the difference until you just described it. Yeah. And that's a big difference. I mean, I know that I can have empathy, but em- being an empath is a totally different thing. It's a totally different thing. And, you know, it's a it's becoming a really popular word and it's going around all over the place. And there's a lot of like different people have very different definitions of it. Some people equate it to being psychic. Some people equate it to being a medium. Some people use it as an excuse for why they can't go out into public or why they can't be around people or why everything is difficult. A friend of mine posted something um, just the other day on Facebook, basically saying, um, being an empath, <laughs> uh, if anything, requires more boundaries, not less. And if you can't be around people, you need to look at like your behavior and how you are handling these things. But, um, you know, the thing is that the term, as I mentioned before, it's not a clinical term. It's a scientist, science fiction term that pop culture has picked up. But for people who have been wondering or struggling with sensitivity for their entire life and wondering why do I feel so intensely, especially when it doesn't correlate with anything in my life. What I have often found is often through using EFT and tapping that many, many times we start realizing, oh, I started to feel this way after I had this encounter with these people, or I started to feel this way because the person in the next room is struggling mightily. And that's why I'm experiencing this insomnia. And, you know, the thing is, it's not black and white. It is not just like this or that. And so often as highly sensitive empaths, what can happen is We can be picking up on things that are going on from the world outside of ourselves, but we will also be activating things that are within us that resonate with that. And so it's not necessarily just a, it's always about the other person. It's often a both, a both and. I see. Yeah. So 
And, and this led you to do the EFT work, which I'm so curious to learn more about and exactly what is EFT? So EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques. And what led me into EFT is that, I mean, I've been a lifelong he- a lifelong learner, a lifelong seeker, uh, also a lifelong healer, and always looking for modalities and things that can be helpful. And as I definitely identify as an empath, as, a, as an empath myself, I struggled a lot and and honestly still do at times struggle with anxiety and also like bouts of blueness and what I wouldn't call it depression because depression I think is more chronic and I tend to be more like I just have these dips and ever since I was like nine or 10 years old, I've been contending with actually probably ever since I've been about four or five years old, I've been contending with my my emotional state and contending with my moods. And so I had come across, I was, you know, I, I was following a number of sort of healing newsletters and things. And I kept running across this one, one newsletter where this guy kept talking again and again about emotional freedom technique. And so I kind of checked it out and it just seemed weird. You know, I'll be honest, it involves like emotional freedom technique is basically to describe it. It's a form of uh, best way to, it's like a mental, emotional acupuncture without the needles, where what we do is we either tap or apply light pressure to certain acupuncture endpoint, meridian endpoints on our face, on our torso. Um, and on our hands are the dominant places where we do, where we tap and think about whatever the issue, the memory, the physical sensation is that is, is sort of that, that feels either out of balance and, um, or painful or uncomfortable that we want to shift. And by just basically focusing on it and using what is called a setup statement, we start by just acknowledging it and tapping on the side of the hand and just acknowledging it. And then after we've done that, we move through the tapping points. It seemed from my perspective, like, how is this even going to work? And I will be the first to say, I was not a fan of the idea of like, looking like a monkey tapping on the top of my head and all over my face when I first started to do it. And I first discovered it back in um, the early aughts. And, uh, you know, like maybe even, I think it was like, I don't know, like 2005, 2007 or something. And I tried it and it didn't land for me. It wasn't until I was driving in an ice storm. My husband was driving and I was the passenger and I have a history of car accidents and I was really panicking. I mean, we were driving in two inches of sleet and it was not, <laughs> the weather conditions were not conducive. And we were coming up from Massachusetts to about, you know, an hour and a half, almost two hours north to our home in Maine. And so I just asked my husband, would you mind if I tried this tapping thing while you drive? And he's like, knock yourself out, do it. And I went from a very distressed, like nine or 10 on a scale of zero to 10 with zero being no feeling whatsoever and 10 being practically off the charts. I went from a very agitated, like nine, 10 to a zero within two rounds of tapping. And I was like, oh my God, there's really something to this. And that was what hooked me. That's what had me go, wow, this really worked. And what I believe personally is that the reason that it had never worked before was that I was never actually tapping on anything that mattered. I was just kind of doing it in theory instead of actually working on something that was quantifiable because I was experiencing distress. Like I was like, oh my God, we're going to die. And it was really funny because it went from, oh my God, we're going to die to, yeah, we could die. <laughs> it was like, and I was just like, okay, you know, it, it will be what it will be. If we get into an accident, we'll deal. But I was like, there was just no emotional charge left on it. I was just completely calm. And that was the moment when I went, 
I really need to learn about this because I was like, there's something to this thing. And that's what kind of drew me in. And um, what is amazing about it is that it has given me a tool to be able to really discern what's mine, what's not mine, what do I need to work on, and what do I really just need to let go of and sort of acknowledge and pretty much say, not my circus, not my monkeys. Wow. That is definitely a powerful story to see that you got immediate results through doing it. And now, now it's part of your life. It is part of my life. And I will say, I mean, I was in, so I was in a car accident when I was 18 years old. It was, it was a doozy. Um, I was in an altered state of consciousness, which did not make things, <laughs> did not help. And um, I was, I was in the passenger seat. We rolled over three times. We skidded 160 feet. The car was completely totaled. I have sort of dual memories of waking up on the ground and climbing out of the car. Like, like it was really quite an intense experience. The driver was thrown out of the car and broke his back. Um, and, you know, interestingly, just out of people, out of curiosity, you know, interestingly, he, this man died in a car accident about 10 years later. I, I, I'm grateful I was not in that moment, but, you know, he just, he was somebody who was just kind of destined to go in a particular direction. But that accident, I had been experiencing PTSD about it for years and years and years afterwards. And I would have nightmares. I would get anxious whenever we were driving. I had tried doing, um, I had done more talk therapy about it than I could even begin to, I could even begin to count. I had done shamanic healing practices, soul retrieval work, breath work around it, doing breath work while driving past the accident site, like all kinds of stuff, even EMDR, because my husband is a trained psychotherapist and at one point was training in EMDR. And he was like, hey, you want to be my guinea pig? Nothing had put a dent in it. I mean, I was I was able to drive. I was able to function, but nothing had ever really made it better until I tapped that day. And that was like it was like a complete sea change. It was like it was like game over complete difference. And that's what, what had me go, I must learn this. I must share this. This is so valuable. And what's awesome about it. And I love, you know, the reason, you know, I love the name of your podcast better than a pill is that for me, this really is better than a pill because it is something that we can do for ourselves. You don't need to work with a practitioner. Sometimes it's helpful to work with a practitioner if it's something really intense or something that you just like, you don't really want to go there. It can be really helpful to have somebody, a skilled practitioner guide you through that process in a really gentle way. But for the basic stuff, like you've got a headache or maybe your knee is aching, or maybe there's just sort of a minor annoyance it is anybody can learn how to do this. It, it takes maybe five or 10 minutes to learn the basic recipe and you can change things. I was able to go from extreme sensitivity to fragrances where I could not walk. I mean, I don't know if I would still choose to walk into like a Yankee candle company store, but like I would have to hold my breath in like the detergent and the candle aisles in any kind of a store. I would start to wheeze if I was like in the mall and walking past Abercrombie, like I would just be like, I would have to hold my breath to walk past like a place like Abercrombie or, you know, Victoria's Secret or something, any place that was pumping out perfume. And as well as I had a lot of food sensitivities and I was able to use tapping to really calm my body down my nervous system down and my reactivity down so that at this point in time, while I would not say I'm a massive fan of driving in bad weather, I'm a lot calmer driving in bad weather. I'm a lot calmer just being a passenger as well as driving. I can eat foods that I used to not be able to eat. And while I certainly do not enjoy smelly fragrances, I no longer like I my lungs don't feel like they're seizing up when I'm exposed to 
a fragrance in the way that I used to. Like it used to be that like if we went to a hotel and they had, um, you know, like a designer fragrance, sort of signature fragrance in the lobby and everything smelled a certain way. I would just be like my, I I would have a really hard time being in a place like that. Like there have been times where I've just been like, we need to get out of here. I can't tolerate this space. And tapping completely changed that for me. So it is definitely better than a pill. And it is the wonderful thing about it is that not only can it help people with emotional issues, but it can also help with physical issues. That is great. And it sounds like, I mean, yeah, this sounds wonderful. I, so, so you can do it in a, in a short period of time as well is what it sounds like. You don't need, you don't need, I mean, if you're working on a really big thing, you know, you can like decide that you're going to like, like untangle the tapestry and pull the threads and go down the rabbit hole and do an hour or even a 90 minute tapping session. That's possible. But even with like five, 10, 15 minutes, Tapping can help to shift gears and can really help. And especially when we are focusing on something really specific. And one of the sayings that um, Ann Adams, who's one of the OG master trainers um, and master, you know, EFT masters from Gary Craig, who is the founder or the, you know, the founder of EFT as we know it today. Ann Adams is one of his, his sort of original uh, students Um, she, she always says, um, specific is terrific. And that's the thing, the more precise, the more specific, the more dialed into the exact thing that's going on for us, the more effective EFT tends to be. Wow. And and for an average person, is it something that's achievable to learn? And how long would that take to learn? You know, it depends. I mean, I guess I would say it depends on your retention. You know, it depends on somebody's capacity for retention and somebody's, um, you know, just like somebody's learning speed. But like the basic recipe, like I've done, um, I've done like reels and you know on Instagram and and like TikTok that where I have literally done a one minute tapping sequence and I've been able to move through the entire tapping sequence in one minute. I have like on my YouTube channel, a learn how to do EFT. And I think the video is like 14 minutes and, you know, where I explain the concepts, I teach people how it works. I mean, I could even like, you know, I could, I could share the basic premises with you right now in five minutes. Like it's that simple getting understanding the nuances of it i'm still working on that like i've been doing this i've been i've been a practitioner since 2013 i've been a master trainer since like 2018 um or yeah 2018 I, i'm just thinking like i became i became a trainer in 2018 um you know so i've been working at it for a while and i would say i'm still discovering the nuances it is a remarkably simple tool, but at the same time, it is also a tool that has so much nuance to it and can be applied in so many different ways that I'm constantly learning new approaches and new sort of like, hey, if you came at it from this angle, it might might be, you know, we might be able to work on this in this other way. But five, you know, like even we can, we can even, even five minutes can make a massive, massive difference. And especially if you just need to get over the hump, like, you know, maybe you are like, oh my God, if I have to do another dish, I think I'm going to kill somebody. You can like go, you know, like if you're in the kitchen alone, you just be even, you know, even though I really don't want to deal with the dishes right now, I'm open to the possibility that this can be easier than I expect. And then, you know, don't want to do the dishes, don't want to do the dishes. And even just that acknowledgement and moving through the points and, you know, and just doing one sequence of tapping can often be enough for us to be able to move the needle so that we can jump over that hurdle and we can move forward. I knew somebody who um, was, when she was first building her business, she was suffered from extreme social anxiety and was incredibly uncomfortable being around people. She would sit in her car and cry before going into a networking event. And then, but she would tap and calm her nervous system down and get herself to a place where she could handle it. 
and then get her, you know, sort of pull herself together and then go in to a networking event. And at this point in time, you would not even recognize this woman from who she had been because she is now like a multi seven figure business coach who is thriving in her world because she was able to move, get out of her own way by using tapping to to jump the hurdle and to be able to accomplish, you know, even these tasks, which might seem like for some people, not a big deal at all. But going back to the empaths, a lot of times things that are not a big deal at all for your neurotypical person can be very challenging for somebody who is highly sensitive and empathic, as well as any number of other ways that somebody could be neurodiverse, tapping can really help. Okay. So I'm just wondering, could we go through a little exercise so everybody gets an understanding, you know, verbally and so forth on maybe an example on how to calm the nervous system or something like that? I would love to do that. So, okay. So I'm going to just teach you the basic recipe and what I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show you, I'll show you the basic recipe and I'll explain it to you. And then what I'm going to do is we'll go through, we'll do go one, do one round on just kind of like acknowledging maybe that we're feeling sort of anxious or agitated about something. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use breathing correlating breathing with the touch, the top tapping points and doing what's called touch and breathe. So a lot of times, as I said before, specific is terrific. So a lot of times when somebody, when somebody first experiments with tapping, they will often be a little bit too general. And so I'm not, we're not going to say, even though I'm feeling anxious, because that's a little bit too broad. And the thing is, the brain is going to try to tell us all the reasons why we're anxious, which will, of course, add to that sense of anxiousness. So instead of instead of focusing on just being anxious, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a physical sensation in our body. So are you feeling any kind of I mean, I'm feeling pretty, I'm actually feeling pretty stable and calm right now. Um, like I've got this teeny little niggling thought about the fact that I've got a cat litter box to clean in a second. I was telling Terry <laughs> before we we got on this, we got on the interview that our baby kitten Zuzu, who's like 14 weeks old, decided to knock over the litter box right before we started. Um, and so she like tipped it over in her in her special little crate. So I'd say I'm maybe experiencing about a two or a three of just kind of like, oh, about that. But do you have any, is there any kind of thing that's kind of like just sort of affecting or impacting your nervous system? Don't you do not have to go into any detail about it at all. As a matter of fact, it's better not to go into any detail, but is there anything going on for you that we could focus on or tune into? Maybe slightly, not a, not a huge amount, but I would say there, there could be a little, uh, very low level. Perfect. Oh, oh, that's, so okay. where would you say, if you were going to tune, imagine that, yeah, there is this little low level, where in your body do you think it is, it is living? Where are you carrying it? In the stomach area. Okay. Um, and I would say, actually, I'm noticing for myself, I've got sort of a band of tension across my forehead. That's like the, oh my God, do not want to deal with the litter box. <laughs> and then, and then this sort of little bit of kind of just a little bit of stomachy kind of feeling as well. Um, So what we're going to do is, like I said, instead of focusing on the emotion right now, what we're going to be focusing on is just the physical sensation in our body of where that feeling of distress is. So it's in your stomach right now. Um, And are you comfortable being the guinea pig for this so that I can you sure? Great. Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. Okay. So what we're going to do right now is the second question I've got for you is if it had a color, what would it be? Well, the first color that comes to mind for some reason is like brown. Okay, perfect. And if you were to guess not to tune into it, but to just guess on a scale of zero to 10, how intense does this feel? What do you guess it would be? And go with the very first number that comes to your mind. Three. That was exactly what I imagined in my head. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to start with tapping on the side of the hand and using what's called the setup statement. 
And the setup statement is a combination of acknowledging what's going on and uh, offering a neutral balance statement to it or a positive balance statement. But I like often sort of to start with something a little bit more neutral. So we would start by tapping on with our three fingers of one hand on the side of the other hand, kind of going down on the side where your pinky finger is running. People used to call this the karate chop point, but because it is not necessarily a reference that everybody would understand and it was considered cultural appropriation. <laughs> we eventually changed it to side of the hand as the descriptor. So we're just going to tap on the side of the hand and you can repeat after me, even though, even though I feel this brown, how would you describe it? Um, blob. Blob of irritation of, I don't even know what, what would you? Even though I feel this brown blob of irritation, yeah, buzzing. Like what would you, how would you, buzzing? I feel this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. I feel this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. I'm open to the possibility. I'm open to the possibility that this can shift. That this can shift. So we just acknowledged it and then we offered what's called the balance statement. Now we're going to do this two more times and I like to switch hands so that I can remember that I've done it three times. So even though, even though I feel this brown buzzing blob in my stomach, I feel this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. And maybe it's about that situation. You don't have to go into any specifics, but you just want to just acknowledge what it's about for you. And even if it's about, and maybe the, it's about, and maybe it's about that situation, that situation, that thing I'm worried about, that thing I'm worried about. So, and if we were tapping, if you were tapping on your own, you would acknowledge it. You'd be like, maybe it's about like, maybe it's about going back to school, whatever it is. I'm just acknowledging it. I'm just acknowledging it. I'm just tapping on it. I'm just tapping on it. And I'm open to the possibility. And I'm open to the possibility that this can shift. That this can shift. So even though. Even though. I'm feeling this brown buzzing blob. I'm feeling this brown buzzing blob. It's in my stomach. It's in my stomach. It's a three. It's a three. And maybe it's about that situation. And maybe it's about that situation. I'm just acknowledging it. I'm just acknowledging it. And I am open to the possibility. And I am open to the possibility that this can and will shift. That this can and will shift. And I'm okay. And I'm okay. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. Now we're going to tap on the top of the head. If you're familiar with yoga, right on the crown chakra or on the fontanelle as the soft spot when you're a baby. And we're just going to acknowledge it by using what's called the reminder phrase, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Now we're going to tap on the eyebrow points, which is right at the top of your eyes, sort of right where your eyebrows meet, unless you have a unibrow like Frida Kahlo, like right at the start of the eye socket, right up sort of like if you have glasses on, like I do kind of right at the top of your glasses, right, you know, right where the bridge of your nose starts. And we're just going to use the reminder phrase again, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Now we're going to tap on the side of the eyes, right on the temples, kind of right between the upper and lower lid, but not on your eyes. So not on your eyelids, but just right on the, on the bone, on the side, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown bl buzzing blob in my stomach. <laughs> I just like to say that 10 times fast. Okay, now we're going to tap <laughs> underneath the eyes, right directly under your pupils, right on the eye socket. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. 
Now we're going to tap underneath the nose. This is where the, what's called the cupid's bow or the philtrum between the lip and the nose. This brown buzzing blob in my this, stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Now we're going to tap between the lip and the chin. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. And now we're going to tap on the collarbone points. And so it's sort of like you find your collarbone and then just kind of come down a little bit, maybe about three quarters and half an inch to three quarters of an inch below the bones. And you can sort of feel around until you feel almost like kind of a saw, sort of like just it kind of clicks. That's true for any point. We're just going to use a reminder phrase again, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. And now finally, we're going to tap underneath the arm, sort of directly parallel to the armpit, kind of on your rib cage, past the breast tissue, um, parallel, depending on <laughs> whether what kind of um, support undergarment you're wearing, <laughs> it may or may not be parallel to your nipple. <laughs> And just again, we're going to say the reminder phrase, this brown buzzing blob, blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. And now we're going to go back to the top of the head. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Let's just do one more round with this without this setup, but just tapping through now that you know we've done all the points. So eyebrow points, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Side of the eyes, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Under the eyes, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Under the nose, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Under the lip, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Collarbone points, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Under the arm, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Back to the top of the head, this brown buzzing blob in my stomach. This brown buzzing blob in my stomach. Let's take a deep breath. And just notice how you're feeling. And if you were to guess on a level of zero, of zero to 10, where we started with a three, what do you guess the brown buzzing blob in your stomach is now? About a one and a half. Perfect. So if we were doing a longer session, we would go in and do another round of tapping on that one and a half. And also what we would do is I would ask you the uh, million dollar question, what did you notice? And chances are, I would imagine you got some clarity as we tapped about what was going on for you and why you might be feeling the way you're feeling. That's generally how it works for people. Yes. It, I feel, I have to say, the thing that strikes me the most is a sensation of calmness um, prior to when we started. And if somehow the tapping stimulated a little bit more calmness mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in my body. Yes. And what tapping does is that and is that it actually so we have a part of our brain that is in charge of the fight or flight mechanism called the amygdala and what tapping allows us to do is to reset the amygdala so that we are not remaining in fight or flight because up you know on up until very recently human beings would when uh, some kind of situation came up and we felt a sense of threat we would flee or freeze. Yes. And the thing is that nowadays, most of our threats are, are, are kind of theoretical. You know, you get a nasty text from somebody, you see, you scroll social media and you see something that's really intimidating. But what, what that does is it doesn't give us any way to discharge the intensity of it. And so often what happens is we're in these sort of cascading loops of distress. EFT allows the amygdala to calm down and reset so that we are not in this cascade of reactivity that as, as a modern society, we tend to be in, like sadly, almost all the time. 
And so by acknowledging it, but also just moving through and tapping through on, on these acupuncture points, it allows all of the places where sort of the energy has been kind of like stuck to be released. I kind of think of it as almost like the sort of in, in the, one of the images that I always have is that it's almost like an ultrasonic cleaner or something that's just kind of shaking. Everything has just been kind of contracted and congested and, and just like in a state of like, I got to deal with this. Just, it allows everything to calm down. But uh, the other thing I mentioned that I when, that we would do another round with just what's called touch and breathe. And this is where if you just have three minutes, you just have a minute, you can go into the, you know, like you just need a break, go into the bathroom and just do even one round of touch and breathe can really help. So we're just going to place our hand on the top of our head and not tapping at all, just putting your hand on the top of your head. We're just going to breathe in and breathe out. And now moving with both going to the eyebrow points and just touching those and just inhaling and exhaling. Now moving to the side of the eyes, again, inhaling and exhaling. Now under the eyes, inhaling and exhaling under the nose, inhaling and exhaling, under the lip, inhaling and exhaling, collarbones, inhaling and exhaling, and now under the arm, inhaling and exhaling. And then back to the top of the head, inhaling and exhaling. How are you feeling? Even calmer. That's great. Isn't that amazing? That's yeah. wonderful. What a wonderful tool. Yeah. Yeah. I, yes. I, I mean, I, I really, what I, I, I sincerely believe that EFT, if we can get it into the hands of enough people, it can change our planet. It can change our world because we can use it to calm and reboot our nervous system. Because the thing is, when we are in a state of reactivity, we do not have the capacity to see the world and to see all of our options. We will literally develop tunnel vision and we will, we will react and we will look for the nearest exit. When we can calm our nervous systems down, we become more resilient, we become more resourced, and we also can respond instead of react, which then allows us to not be reacting from a traumatized, like so often, if we've not have, if we don't, haven't ever discovered any tools to release the distress that we carry in our bodies then what's happening is anytime anything resembles a traumatic experience we had in our childhood or young adulthood or anything, what happens is that that traumatized part of us is driving the bus. So for so many people on the planet, it's a five-year-old that's in charge of absolutely everything. And what is so exquisite about EFT is that we can use it for physical pain. We can use it for, um, we can use it for sensitivities and reactivity. Like I said, I was able to use it for, um, I was able to use it for my food sensitivities and my fragrance sensitivities. We can use it for memories, difficult memories um, and clear the events. So eventually I went back into the original car accident and tapped on that and shift and released the charge on that. We can use it for the emotions that are going on. We can use it for difficult relationships and situations that are going on where we're feeling confused or unsure or irritated or whatever, we can use it for limiting beliefs and thoughts uh, that are getting in our way, like I'll never amount to anything or I'm not worthy or, you know, um, like nice girls don't ask for a lot of money or whatever it is that is holding us back. We can also use it to work on ancestral healing and trauma that is way back in our ancestral lines, as well as if you're into the woo stuff, we can also use it for even like past life memories 
and past life trauma. I have not yet found anything that EFT doesn't benefit in some way. I mean, it can't set a bone. (laughs) You're going to have to go (laughs) see a doctor for that. But what it can do is it can help calm your nervous system down about the fact that you broke your arm and allow you to be in a state of resourcefulness and also in a state of a lot more ease and grace so that you can navigate whatever it is that's coming next. Yes. And there is so much power in all that you showed us today. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on here. What a gift. Um, Absolutely. And I have included links to Jennifer's website and she has an EFT instruction site and a guide, right? And a guide on empathic safety. And that's all included in this episode. So check that out and take that tool today and put it to use. And again, thank you so much, Jennifer. Oh, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, as you can tell, I love EFT and any chance I get to talk about it, I'm just like, it it just, it is, it's the best day ever. So thank you for making my day. Absolutely. And I, I can feel that in you and, and thank you again. And remember, we do new episodes every week on Wednesday, and I look forward to having you join me then.